So World Tinnitus Day, this is the first year of World Tinnitus Day. Um, all of our physical events are taking place in Dublin, uh, just Dublin this year, um, with um, some online information and movement as well, um, with the hope to kind of building it out as a, a more global uh, initiative in the coming years. Um, so we've had support from a lot of tennis associations from all over the world, um, different organisations as well uh, related to hearing and companies and individuals as well who have an interest in or um, who care about hearing and specifically tinnitus. Um, so to give you just a quick rundown of the day, anyone who didn't get a lanyard, um, I've got a few spare ones here and there's also um, plenty more at the registration desk downstairs. Um, so we've got talks every half, or sorry, pretty much a new one every half hour or so. Um, so we've won now, uh, we'll finish up about half two and there'll be a half an hour lunch break. We've lunch downstairs, there's tea, coffee, soup, sandwiches um, and there are some sweet treats as well if you like. Um, our talk then at two o'clock is Does Tinnitus Cause Hearing Loss from Anne Hogarth. Um, at 3.30 we have Preventative Measures with Dr Nina Reid. At four o'clock we have What is Many Ears Disease and Is It Linked to Tinnitus? Uh, and that's Rita Power. Um, and then at 4.30, the Hearing Health Foundation have provided us with a video all about central auditory processing and some of the, the current research that's going on at Tinnitus. And then at 5 o'clock, we've got a 50-minute panel discussion. So we're going to have four different people who either suffer from tinnitus themselves or deal with it in their work um, all day, every day. Um, and we'll be just discussing experiences with tinnitus and there'll be some time for questions there as well. Um, so feel free to um, pick up a leaflet and if you need any more information, feel free to approach myself, any of the Restored Hearing member, team members or any of the World Tinnitus Day volunteers. They all have appropriate t-shirts on downstairs. Um, so I'm going to just give a quick sort of 20-minute talk about tinnitus. Um, obviously kind of more general information and more of an overview um, feel free to come and grab me over lunch if you've got any more questions or I can maybe point you in the direction of some other resources as well for information if you like. Um, so tinnitus affects over 300 million people all over the world. Um, around 10% of the population has it to some extent and around 2% of the population um, has it to a very severe level where it very severely impacts their day-to-day -day life. Um, Tinnitus is often described as ringing in the ears, but for many people it's not ringing. It can be a buzzing noise, a chirping noise, um, really any kind of phantom noise. Uh, it, that's what tinnitus is. It doesn't actually even have to be a specific type. Um, there's two types of tinnitus, uh, subjective and objective so objective tinnitus is caused by often blood flow um, or some kind of diagnosable uh, and a sound that someone else can hear, whereas subjective tinnitus, only the person with it themselves can hear it. Um, and subjective tinnitus is the one that causes lots more trouble in terms of both diagnosis and treatment, um, as it's a, a perceptive condition that no one else can tell you you have or to what extent you might have it um, or whether it's getting better or worse, things like that. Um, so around two-thirds of tinnitus is caused by either noise or age-related problems. Um, a lot of people would get tinnitus from working, say, in a noisy environment. Um, lots of ex-builders, construction workers, miners, all that kind of thing um, would often, very often uh, suffer from tinnitus. And there's a very strong correlation with uh, hearing loss and tinnitus. Um, I know anecdotally a lot of audiologists would say for every two people they would have come in for hearing aid fittings one of those would have tinnitus as well. Um, so it, while they don't have to appear together, they very, very frequently do. Um, and interestingly, or rather maybe sadly, um, some new research has come out now in the last year to 18 months showing that now one in five teenagers has quite severe tinnitus. Um, this is a study done in the Netherlands just a little over a year ago. Um, they're linking this in most particular to, to noise damage and using things like iPhones and, uh, and MP3 players and listening to them much too loud. But um, there really is, we feel certainly, a lack of awareness and a lack of uh, maybe knowledge about 
the levels of damage that noise can do, particularly in younger generations. And that's something that we've, we've tried to be quite uh, prominent in speaking about. Um, I read a very interesting article actually just this week about the Boston Marathon survivors and how while many of their physical um, ailments have now healed two years on, tinnitus is actually one of the problems that has affected most of the, the people who are at the, the very unfortunate scenes those days. Um, and uh, the, the noise damage that they experienced, um, sometimes in case of sort of burst eardrums and uh, things, really has left the most lasting uh, and most sort of memorable scar on them, which is pretty, pretty unfortunate. Um, so to kind of talk about other, um, other types of, or sorry, other causes of tinnitus beyond noise, um, Meniere's disease is um, another cause of tinnitus, or certainly it's one of the sim- tinnitus is one of the symptoms that comes with Meniere's disease. Um, we actually have the Irish Meniere's Society with us today. Um, they're downstairs in the exhibition space, and we'll also be speaking later this afternoon. So uh, I'll leave their much more expert in this. I'll leave them to um, talk more about that. But typically, Meniere's um, people will have tinnitus uh, balance balance issues and uh, vertigo as well so it can be really quite a quite an affliction um, other causes can be things like ear infections that have uh, either gone untreated or maybe repeated ear infections um, tinnitus has been linked uh, has some is sometimes the um, one of the indicators of tumours, sometimes on the auditory nerve or brain tumours. Um, and scarring of the auditory nerve can be uh, a cause there as well. Um, and then another form of tinnitus is, is psychosomatic tinnitus. So tinnitus that appears um, quite literally out of the blue, that there is no good explanation or reason for why it might have ever occurred, um, but it is it is there and someone is experiencing it. Um, that's maybe one of the most kind of difficult ones to deal with, certainly initially, um, as it seems so so lacking in reason. Um, so there there really are very many causes. I've kind of described some of the more, uh, more common ones here today. But I think that gives an, some idea of, because there are so many different causes, obviously then solving the problem of tinnitus is a much more complicated endeavour than just treating just one thing. Um, And I think that's pretty accurately reflected in the range of options for tinnitus sufferers, um, some of which I'll talk about today. Um, But again, this is by no means an exhaustive list. There are are very, very many options um, because there are so very many different sources of the problem. Um, so there is no existing cure for tinnitus. There's no kind of one, one size fits all solution to the problem. However, there's ongoing research, um, and it would seem to be that there's increasing numbers of research. Um, I was at a conference just a few weeks ago, and tinnitus seems to be becoming increasingly popular for um, audiology and kind of uh, PhD students in terms of research. Um, which is a great thing to see and the funding seems to be getting even better for it as well with um, organisations like the British and American Tinnitus Associations in particular raising their own funds to support um, ongoing tinnitus research. So that research isn't just into treatments either, it's also into the causes and um, and the effects. So trying to get a better understanding of what's going on so that they might then be able to, to lead that more towards uh, understanding how to how to resolve that or how to alleviate the problem in some way. Um, so one of the first steps that that's often taken when someone is trying to um, relieve their tinnitus with is education and information. Um, it has been shown that providing good, reliable information to a tinnitus sufferer. Um, soon after their diagnosis can help an awful lot in kind of normalizing the uh, normalizing the condition and helping someone understand that they're not the only person who suffers from this that the noise that only they can hear in their head other people have th- th- is this exact same problem um, and that there are ways of managing it um, education and information is often used in conjunction with other types of therapies also which is true of 
most of the things I'm going to talk about today. So uh, it's it's often a combination of factors rather than any one thing that gives uh, that gives the best relief. Um, and there's no real way of predicting uh, for a person as to which combination is going to work for them. Um, cognitive behavioural therapy has become popular in the last. Um, maybe kind of 10 to 20 years for tinnitus also. So that cognitive behavioural therapy is a psychotherapy um, and it works on changing the behaviours and the thought processes around tinnitus. Um, cognitive behavioural therapy is also quite widely used for um, addiction problems, it can be used for depression and anxiety, um, so it's coming at tinnitus um, with a lot of sort of um, counselling, kind of one-to-one one-to-one counselling and interaction with a a trained psychotherapist. Um, Neuromodulation as well is another popular popular method of uh, treating tinnitus. So without going into great detail in kind of brain patterns and how the brain works, um, neuromodulation is basically seeking to alter the way that neurons in the brain react to alleviate the tinnitus, so by changing the way the brain is sort of misfiring in a sense, um, as it's misfiring when it's creating those tinnitus or the the tinnitus or the phantom sounds, um, it's aiming to kind of um, address that misfiring. Um, so the current research that's out there shows uh, quite a lot of success with this, using uh, in some cases sounds and in other cases uh, electrical stimulation to uh, to counteract this this misfiring. Um, Is um, d- um, that changes in the air where you get the ringing in the air? How long does that last? How long can it last? Yeah. Um, some people have it 24-7 and it never goes away. Um, other people can have it sometimes for a few hours and it'll subside. It, it very much depends on the individual. Yeah, yeah. 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 It can be that. That's the thing as well. For so, for some people, they'll maybe have it for very short periods, but um, many periods during the day. Other people have no no pause at all. Um, again, very varied from person to person as to how their experience is. Yeah. There, there's no there's no one again one size fits all in that regard. Um. Another common uh, common treatment or therapy for tinnitus is sound therapy. Um, again, often used in conjunction with um, counselling or education um, or neuromodulation also. Um, there are an awful lot of different options in sound therapies. Lots of different types of it exist. Um, various lengths of time are prescribed as dosages. Um, there's also an awful lot of variation in terms of the levels of research uh, behind the various types. So some are very well researched and quite well reputed, um, others are not. Um, it's a very broad category. So. Um, it can work very well, and it often does work very well, particularly in uh, in tinnitus retraining therapy, which is one of the um, one of the other common uh, treatments or common sort of prescriptions for tinnitus. So, tinnitus retraining therapy is basically trying to habituate the tinnitus, or try to um, try to get yourself increasingly used to it um, and develop more of a tolerance for it so it's not as uh, impactful on your life. Um, Tinnitus retraining therapy typically combines some element of counselling, excuse me, and also some element of uh, sound therapy to alleviate the tinnitus. Um, It has very high success rates but often uh, this is kind of cited as it's due to, because it's so personalised. Um, so it, it sort of aims to find the combination of things that work best for the individual um, and for that reason has very good results. Um, increasingly popular, and I think we have a few different talks about this over the course of the day or certainly will be mentioned, is uh, the role of stress relief in tinnitus. Um, and 
using coping mechanisms or sort of a holistic approach, um, not so much to target the tinnitus itself specifically, but rather to target the impact of the tinnitus on a person's life. So trying to develop coping mechanisms and trying to develop ways of um, not focusing on the tinnitus and, and not feeling quite so anxious or perhaps stressed about the tinnitus itself. Um, that's a really interesting area and I think hasn't really been spoken about an awful lot until the last few years, but is increasingly being looked at as a, a sort of a more holistic and certainly a non-invasive approach to trying to um, try to involve tinnitus in your lifestyle in the least um, least impactful way possible so that you can get on with with your life and get on with living um, while still having it there um, so there is a, that's just sort of a, a selection of the, some of the types of therapies available um, obviously different companies and different providers are doing different selections of these kinds of things um, I specifically didn't kind of go into companies I don't want to mention one and not not the other in any case um, but if ever anyone has uh, any extra questions about any of those or, or wants examples um, please do feel free to uh, to approach me afterwards I think one of the interesting things about tinnitus is that no no one thing works for anyone um, and while that's bad in many ways it's also sort of interesting I think there's an opportunity there for um, for providers and for audiologists and doctors who deal with tinnitus patients to really uh, work with them to find the best solutions and the best management um, they can for a person's tinnitus. Um, there's also a really broad range of research going on, um, everything from stem cells to magnetic stimulation of the brain um, to kind of medita meditation for tinnitus. It really is a very, very broad field of research right now, which is incredibly exciting as well. Um, I think that there's no cure, but I think that's not to say that there's no hope. Um, there's an awful lot of very intelligent people working on some very exciting, uh, very exciting work that could, be, um, could offer great relief for people in the future. Um, so that's just an overview of tinnitus, some of the causes and some of the uh, therapies or treatments that are out there at the moment.